And we're moving on to the third talk. Now we're moving from uh, Southeast Asia to South America. And the talk will be given by uh, Matthias Wuy from the University at Albany. Okay. Thank you very much, Heinz. Um, I also want to <clears throat> thank my colleague, René Garro. Much of what I'm going to show is um, based on a paper we wrote a few years ago as an outcome of a, another pages meeting in Argentina. It's still in press, but hopefully will be out soon. So what I want to do is, is basically touch on four points. And um, the first, I want to say a few more words about the atmospheric circulation over South America. Larry Peterson, I'm very grateful for, for his talk because he made some comments that I would like to sort of add to a little bit from a, a climate dynamics perspective. What is the role of the ITCC and what is the role of the South American monsoon over South America? And then quickly present the, the fingerprint of the main modes of climate variability on interannual to decadal timescales. I'm going to focus just on precipitation and temperature. Say a few words about this issue that was just brought up about natural versus anthropogenic change. Are we in an area where we, these modes may already be tainted by um, um, anthropogenic climate change and it may be difficult to actually reconstruct natural variability. And finally, I want to show you a new, a very exciting record um, from tropical South America um, that covers the last 2,000 years. I want to say a few words about um, some, some new ideas about the Little Ice Age in, in tropical South America. So this here shows you um, the sort of the seasonal cycle of precipitation and low level circulation over South America. Northern Hemisphere summer and um, Southern Hemisphere summer. And you can see these fairly narrow green bands of, of um, precipitation over the ocean. And climate dynamics tend to make a clear distinction between an ITCC as a maritime feature and monsoons over the continent. And the reasons they're doing that is because dynamically they're very different. Now, the question is whether this is something that really matters on longer paleoclimatic timescales or whether it's just semantics that we can more or less ignore. Now, personally, I would argue that it, it does actually matter. And, and the reason I think it is important to draw this distinction is that these two features are sensitive um, to different types of forcings. The ITCC basically responds to the underlying SSTs. And it is driven primarily or forced primarily by meridional temperature gradients. So it's quite easy to shift the ITCC north or south. Monsoon systems are sensitive to summer insulation changes. And as such, they're sensitive to land-sea temperature contrasts. But they're also sensitive to vegetation feedbacks, to soil moisture, to exchanges with um, extra tropics, and particularly in South America to the east of, of the Andes Cordillera. So I think it's much more difficult to actually invoke large shifts in the monsoon system. I'm not saying it can't be done. But you may just see an intensification of a monsoon system rather than a huge change latitudinally north or south. So if we want to find places in South America where we can reconstruct um, modes of climate variability at high resolution, we may want to go to places where we actually have large interannual variability. And this figure here um, shows you the interannual variability as expressed as standard deviation both for temperature, this is the, the gray figure on the left, and for precipitation on the right. The, the left figure may be a little bit hard to read for temperature, but basically what this is showing is that temperature variability on interannual timescales is largest in the subtropics, and it's more than twice as large in terms of the amplitude as you would find it in the tropics, which is one of the reasons why we're still having hard times to come up with good temperature reconstructions in the tropics, while it's much easier in mid and high latitudes. The middle figure shows you the interannual variability for precipitation, and it's just expressed as millimeters. And of course, if you look at the absolute variability, then you see the largest variability can be found in the wet regions, in the tropics and along the west coast um, of South America in uh, Chile. 
but there's another way of looking at this, and that is saying, well, let's standardize the data and look at the relative change compared to the absolute amount of precipitation that is falling. So look at the variability in percent, and that's the third figure over on the right. And if you do that, it's sort of an inverse pattern, and now you have the largest interannual variability in precipitation in the dry regions, northeastern Brazil and along the arid diagonal from um, um, southern Peru, northern Chile, then crossing over the Andes into the um, Argentinian Pampas. So something to keep in mind as well. So what are the main modes on interannual to decadal timescales that influence precipitation and temperature? The ones we looked at are ENSO, certainly the most important mode, the PDO in the middle, and the southern annular mode, also known as Antarctic Oscillation, over on the right. The top three panels are for precipitation, the bottom three are for temperature. Now, arguably, there are more modes, and there's one in particular that we did not look at, and we maybe should have, and that is tropical Atlantic variability, which has a big impact in particular over northeastern Brazil and also uh, parts of the um, Amazon basin. But what's shown here are regression fields. So basically, that tells you the departure in millimeters or degrees Celsius associated with a unit um, variation in the index time series. So if you look on the top, Left figure here, and so the red colors, those are the region where it's dry during El Nino, wet during La Nina. Green is, is um, the exact opposite. And you can see we have, as a sort of rule of thumb, sort of a dipole pattern, dry conditions during El Nino in the tropics, wet conditions in the, in the mid-latitude subtropics. The PDO looks very similar, it's just that the amplitude is much weaker. And for the southern annular mode on the right, the only two regions that really see a strong impact with regard to precipitation are um, um, central Chile and also southeastern uh, Brazil, or southeastern um, South America. For temperature at the bottom, it's basically a positive um, relationship. So El Nino leads to a warming, La Nina leads to a cooling, strongest along the west coast of South America. The PDO is very similar but weaker. And the southern annular mode has a very strong impact on temperature um, in the, the southern tip of South America. Now, one thing I should add is that this kind of analysis implicitly assumes that the relationship is linear. In other words, if you have an El Nino that is twice as large as a previous El Nino, the impact should be twice as large in terms of precipitation or temperature. Or if you have an El Nino event of a certain magnitude and then you have a La Nina event of the same magnitude, it should lead to the exact opposite response, but the same magnitude. And the good news is, is that over many regions of South America, sort of as a rule of thumb, this is actually true. Not everywhere, but in, in, in many locations. Um, if you're using proxies that are related to precipitation, it's very likely that your proxy is seasonally biased, because in many parts of South America, particularly the subtropics, you have a strong seasonal cycle. And so you may not want to look at an annual mean impact, but actually um, pick out the season when your proxy is actually responding to um, the precipitation seasonal cycle. And you can see that throughout the year, sort of the general response, again, the top is, is for um, precipitation, the top four panels, four different seasons. The general pattern of um, um, dry conditions during El Nino in the tropics and wet conditions in the subtropics holds throughout the year. But there are some subtle changes, and there are certain regions, um, Venezuela in particular, where in, in one season you have a, a negative relationship, and in the next season you have a positive relationship. There are some other regions, lowland Bolivia is another region. So it is something to keep in mind um, when, you, when you analyze proxies from a certain area. For temperature, the bottom four panels, it doesn't change too much throughout the year. Um, but the amplitude does change. The strongest impact, of course, is, is at the end of the calendar year. That has to do with the phase locking of ENSO, which tends to peak at that time of the year. It's also still very strong between March and May, because the temperature response to ENSO tends to be delayed by a few months. But then the rest of the year, um, it's, it's significantly weaker. Now, I want to say a few words about potential ways to reconstruct these modes, and there are many efforts that have been done, and I think we now have a number of, um, of um, different archives that have shown to be sensitive to some of these modes, and I want to just show you the example of ENSO in the Andes as, as one example. 
the earliest um, of these reconstructions, probably also the famous ones um, from Laguna Palcacocha, Don Rodbell and Chris Moy's work, you're probably all familiar with. Um, but in the Andes, we can also look at ice cores. Um, we have shown that the stable isotopic um, composition of these ice cores is sensitive to ENSO, which is shown over here. And this is the correlation of, of SSTs with um, oxygen-18 from three Andean cores. And interestingly enough, you can actually reproduce this pattern if you use GCMs that are fitted with stable isotopic tracers. Um, very recent work by Duncan Christie and colleagues using tree rings. Um, I think there will be um, a talk and posters that go into more detail on this, but um, these are two chronologies. You see the red dot um, where these chronologies are in the central Andes. The top two figures um, show you the correlation with SSTs, clearly show an ENSO signal. The middle two panels are sea level pressure, reminiscent of the southern oscillation, and the bottom two are upper tropospheric zonal wind, which also clearly show the the strengthening of the subtropical jets and um, the westerly winds over the Andes. So I think we are at a point where we now have a number of different proxies that maybe at some point we can try to combine to come up with some sort of a multi-proxy reconstruction of some of these modes. Now one caveat I, I wanted to add is um, the issue of stationarity. Um, that is something that can be a problem in particular if you have a proxy in a region that is not directly affected by ENSO, but indirectly through atmospheric teleconnections. These kinds of sites tend to be, um, show some non-stationarity because um, the atmospheric waveguide that sets up this teleconnection is sensitive to the exact location in the Pacific where the latent heat release takes place. And that can change um, on a number of different timescales. So here is one example showing this. This is from Corrientes, this is in northern Argentina, and it shows you the correlation between precipitation and um, the southern oscillation through time based on a 30-year moving average. And you can see um, that the strength of the correlation goes up and down. Sometimes it's significant, sometimes it's not. The good news is it's all, it doesn't change sign. It's always positive, but still it's very weak and non-significant at, at certain periods. So something to be aware of. Another thing that may become a problem and that was just mentioned is that some of these modes have shown sort of an unusual behavior over the last few decades, and that is in particularly true for the southern antler mode, the green curve here at the bottom, which has shown a trend towards its um, positive polarity, uh, likely related to um, ozone depletion in the, in the stratosphere over, over Antarctica. So it's possible that if we have um, proxies and we need to calibrate or validate over that time period that we're not just picking up um, a, a signal of natural variability anymore. Finally, and this is my last comment. I want to um, quickly show you some, some new record, or one new records from um, the Little Ice Age over continental South America. There's been a flurry of papers. You've probably seen many of these or are co-authors on these that have documented that during the Little Ice Age, the inner tropical convergence zone was displaced south. And it appears to be the case both over the Pacific and the Atlantic. And that is also consistent with modeling studies which show that this southward displacement is simply a dynamical response to the, to the need to transport more heat northward to basically balance this cooling. But over continental South America, we don't have too many really good records that are high resolution and that cover this entire time interval. We have indications from lake sediments, from um, geomorphologic records, moraines in particular, glacial features, that suggest that at least in the Andes it was colder and it was cooler during the Little Ice Age. The one record that we've had for a while, of course, is Kelkaya, which is the record here on top and which clearly shows an excursion during the Little Ice Age, more depleted values, initially interpreted as, as cooler te temperatures. Um, there is a new record now which has not yet been published, which is the one in, in, in the middle um, from Broxtonburg, Bird, Mark Abbott and colleagues from the University of Pitch Pittsburgh which I think is a really exciting record. This is based on laminated sediments from a lake in Peru. It's annually resolved for the last 2,300 years. And it's, what you see here is an oxygen-18 record from, from calcite. And it also clearly shows this cooling here during, or I shouldn't say cooling, this um, depletion during the Little Ice Age. You even see um, more enriched values during medieval times. 
And this record, the nice thing about it is it actually covers the entire Holocene, not annually resolved, but we have an, a, a full Holocene record. And if you were to interpret this in, as temperature, you would run into big problems because you would have to invoke several degrees of warming in the early Holocene at a time of an insulation minimum. So this cannot be a temperature record. Instead, we interpret this as a record of the tropical hydrologic cycle, which was intensified during the Little Ice Age. If you want a, a stronger monsoon, led to more depleted values, and at the same time, the medieval, during medieval times, a more enriched values, a weakened tropical hydrologic cycle. Now you see the curve at the bottom. This is the Moberg et al. Northern Hemisphere temperature reconstruction. And you can see how nicely these two line up. Now these are independent records and they, they um, record something completely different. The green curve is temperature in the Northern Hemisphere. The black curve is the hydrologic cycle over the South American continent. And it shows you how sensitive tropical precipitation can be to forcing from the Northern Hemisphere. So I think this is really a beautiful record that, that, that starts to show that the cooling in the northern hemisphere did have a significant impact on the hydrologic cycle on the South American monsoon. But whether this is actually a shift, we can't tell. Certainly not from this record alone. But what we can say is that it is an intensification, a strengthening of the hydrologic cycle. So just to conclude or wrap up what I already mentioned, I think if at all possible, it's a good thing to make a distinction between an ITCC and a monsoon because they are different and they are sensitive to different forcings. Um, if you are analyzing or trying to reconstruct modes of climate variability, be aware of a seasonal bias. But the good news is that most of these modes actually have a linear impact in South America. Non-stationarity can be a problem. I think we need more records from the tropics. We have a fairly a good, good archive now, high resolution archive, mostly documentary sources, tree rings um, from mid, and, mid latitudes in southern South America, but not really from the tropics. Um, the issue that the climate is changing rapidly and affects some of these modes can be a problem. And finally, I think that we have now evidence, clear evidence, that the southward displacement of the ITCC over the oceans was accompanied by a strengthening of the hydrologic cycle um, over the continent. So, thank you. Yes, I wondered if you could clarify for me. I thought we heard this morning that during Heinrich events that there's a drying on Venezuela associated with a wetting in southern Brazil, um, which has loosely been referred to as a southward shift in the ITCZ. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought you said that you're not moving your monsoon, you're only changing the strength. I, I can't make these two agree with each other. Yeah, I would not necessarily say that you can't use a, a, a model of an ITCC displacement over those coastal areas. I mean, certainly northeastern Brazil is influenced by, by shifts in the, in the ITCC. So uh, uh, the monsoon is, is really continental and it, it, is, it is inland. But if you, if you um, look at coastal records over northeastern Brazil, northeastern Brazil is influenced by the ITCC on, on a seasonal basis even so. I, I, I don't see that as, as being inconsistent. And I'm not saying that the monsoon can't shift. I'm just saying it's harder to do than an ITCC. And it, it may sometimes, what we think is a, a shift, may simply be an intensification. Other questions? Uh, how can you explain the difference between this enhancement in the um, summer monsoon precipitation in the Andes, in the central Andes, and uh, diminished monsoon activity in the southernmost influence of the monsoon during the Little Ice Age? I mean, these uh, wet conditions that you say in the, with the enhanced mm -hmm. summer precipitation and dry conditions in the central part of the the Pampas, for instance. Uh, at the top of my head, I, I, I can't tell you, but again, if you have one record and it shows you a, a change in the intensity, it does not necessarily say anything about the spatial pattern. Um, 
plus you, you are probably in a location where you have strong interactions with the extra tropics so, and I don't know what, what, whether there were any changes in seasonality at that location either. <laughs> 